All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our final webinar in our winter webinar series. This is Carrick Spotlight Insights from the Mount Cuba Report. We're excited to talk with you today about Carex and why we love it so much here at Midwest Ground Covers. My name is Jamie Heflin, and I will be your host for today's meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items. This is a webinar, so your camera and your microphone have been disabled. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box. We will likely answer questions periodically throughout the webinar, and if we're not able to get to it during um, the presentation, we will have time for questions at the end as well. Um, we are scheduled to go an hour for this webinar, but as often happens, a lot of the times the questions kind of move into the, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes afterwards. So hopefully you can stick around for that. We will be um, sending out a couple of polls during the webinar as well. These are anonymous and they're just kind of for us to gauge what your interest is and, and how things are going. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and it'll be available on our YouTube channel um, within the next few weeks. Our presenters for today's webinar are Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Nikki Moline, and Product Manager, Shannon McInerney. We are also joined today by Midwest Natural Garden Nursery Manager, Enrique Rodriguez. Over the years, Nikki has spent a lot of time learning about the variations between different carrick species, and this past fall, she had the opportunity to visit the Mount Cuba Center. As Vice President of Sales and Marketing here at Midwest Ground Covers, Nikki spends her days leading the sales, marketing, and operations team, while also strategizing on future plans. As Product Manager, Shannon oversees the purchasing, product line development, and plant accession process. Shannon helps to ensure any new plants added to our lineup meet our quality standards and serve a need for our customers. We're excited to have Enrique with us today. He is our resident care specialist. As nursery manager of Midwest Natural Garden, Enrique is intimately involved with our natural garden natives plants from the point of collection of seeds to propagation, growing, and ultimately getting the plants out the door to our customers. Enrique um, will be on hand to share his expertise throughout as well. So with that, I am now gonna get us um, started here and send it over to Nikki. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I think we all know Carex is a huge topic, and uh, it's definitely being used more in the landscape. So we're excited to kind of share um, what we've learned through our own experiences, as well as what um, we read through the Mount Cuba uh, trial. So our agenda today will be talking a little bit just generally about Carex. Um, as a genus. And then we'll do an overview of the Mount Cuba trial. Um, again, just an overview of how the trial was conducted um, and kind of what they were measuring. And then we'll talk about those top performers um, through that Mount Cuba trial that we here, you know, carry at Midwest. Um, not all of the carrots in that trial were native to Illinois, so we don't carry all of them. Um, and then we also have some additional species where maybe we had um, a better experience with them than Mount Cuba did or we felt like they were worth talking about. So we'll go through those um, at the end. So um, we'll kick off by talking a little bit about Carex. Uh, so like I mentioned, there are a ton of Carex. There's about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 different species of Carex. It's one of the largest genera of flowering plants, um, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and another kind of fun fact about Carex, they're also pretty promiscuous like oaks. So you often see a lot of crosses out in um, a natural setting uh, because they, they breed that way. So all um, Carex are, you know, can propagate themselves. So they're not, you know, based by sex like other plants. Um, how you identify Carex? So we get asked this question a lot. Um, you know, the age old, I guess, rhyme that people say is Carex uh, sedges have edges. And so when you're looking at a cross section of Carex, it forms a triangle. Um, and if you're looking at a grass, it's usually a circle. So that's how you would identify Carex if you were out in a natural area. Uh, Carex are able to grow in, grow in a very wide range of 
settings. And what's kind of interesting is as we go through this presentation today, you'll kind of hear Shannon and I talk about the, the native range of a lot of these characters. It's very large. So they're very well adapted to a lot of different um, landscape or natural settings, um, even on one species. So we'll kind of go through what that looks like today. Uh, they have a very wide range of uses, so you can see them in the landscape from, you know, use of a ground cover, a lawn substitute, um, all the way to rain gardens, restoration projects, um, you know, pond or stream edges, so very, very versatile plants. There are eight very critical plants um, as we talk about, you know, ecological reasons for using them. Um, they're usually pretty heavy seed. Um, a lot of them are heavy you know, seed providers, which, you know, are a food source for birds, for small mammals. Um, and they're also a very critical host plant for a lot of butterflies and moths, which is not really, I think, well known or talked about. So I, I think a lot of us don't equate like sedges or grasses to that kind of thing, because they're not a pollen source. They are, you know, not a feeding source, but more of a larval um, feeding source. So um, they're very generally very low maintenance. So we're going to talk today, this is why we actually had Enrique on here, so we could talk about the maintenance of the plants and things that we're experiencing here at Midwest um, through our Carex classroom. Uh, so usually the plants only really require a late winter, early spring cutback, um, but we have tried some other methods like burning. So Enrique will talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation. Um, and like I kind of mentioned at the beginning, we're really focused here today on the carrots that are native to Illinois. So there were others in the trial um, that we're not gonna talk about because we don't carry them because they're not native to Illinois. So um, so from there, um, I have a couple of pictures of the carrots classroom that I just wanted to show you guys. So I have one for every season, basically. Um, carrots are cool season grass, or cool season sedges, excuse me. <laughs> so they do most of their growing in the spring and then the fall. Um, in the summertime, they're not actively growing. They do not actively grow when the temperatures are very warm. Um, and that includes on the tops and the roots. So um, this first picture is from April and you can, or late April, I think early May, and you can see how lush the Carex classroom is. Um, we have many different species of Carex in the Carex classroom and Enrique takes care of that space. Um, we do keep notes on how things are performing, um, you know, how much seed they set, um, how much maintenance we have to do, you know, if they flop, if they brown in the summer, um, so different kind of things like that. So this is the, the spring, which again, carrots love early spring, so they look nice and lush. So if we move to the next slide, we're going to show you a picture here of the summer. Um, and I believe this was taken in July, so it looks a little bit different. Um, again, one of the things we're going to talk about today is when Carex go ahead and seed, and a lot of them do their seeding in um, late spring, early summer, they tend to get a little tired uh, because they produce their seed and then it gets warm, um, which they don't totally care for, most Carex. So they do kind of lay down a little bit more, look a little floppier. Not, some, not all Carex are created equally, so some do stay more upright. But this is very natural um, to see in the summer months, and most of them will recover in the fall once it gets cooler. So the next slide is going to be a picture of the Carex classroom in the fall. So this is a later picture. I think it's early November, um, but you can see many of the Carex are still green, covering the ground um, and looking quite beautiful. So our experience with the Carex classroom has been awesome because it allows us to really get hands-on experience with the Carex, watch how they grow, um, watch what they do in a natural environment, and you know, share our success stories and our failures with you guys, which is you know what we want to do. So, um, from there, I think we'll jump over to Shannon, and she'll share a little bit about Mount Cuba Trial. Yes. So, uh, so the Mount Cuba Trial. I uh, wanted to give some background on that. So, Mount Cuba is located in. Hawkinson, Delaware, which is kind of the greater Philadelphia area, so about 40 miles um, southwest of Philadelphia. And there's Zone 7 there, so kind of right on the border between 7A and 7B on the new USDA map. Um, and so Mount Cuba now is, for about 10 years, I believe, it's been a public garden. Um, but prior to that, it was a private estate. 
at some point though, even before it was certified as a public garden, they did have the horticultural staff doing trials there. So I, I think the trials have been going on for about 20 years or so. Um, and you may have seen some of their reports before. We've They've done Monarda, Aster, um, I think kind of the one that was happening after Carex was Vernonia. Um, and so the trial garden team evaluates native plants and their related culture cultivars um, for horticultural and ecological value. So the, basically their aim is similar if you have ever seen um, the plant evaluation reports from the Chicago Botanic Garden by Richard Hockey. It's the same thing as that. So they're evaluating, you know, species at the CBG for the Midwest. Uh, Mount Cuba is kind of doing the same thing for the Mid-Atlantic. So the Carex trial was a four-year trial. It was planted in fall of 2017, and there were 65 species and five cultivars included in this. And most of them were commercially available, but there were a few that were kind of locally native to the Delaware area um, that are were not commercially available. Um, so if you go through and you know you can find this report, they did produce some hard copies, but it also all the information's online. So if you're looking into this more later and you're finding some varieties, you might not be able to find everything um, out on the market that they evaluated. But um, so like I said, they planted in fall of 2017. The first year they did provide supplemental watering to help with establishment, but after that, there was no supplemental water and very limited uh, maintenance otherwise. So no fertilizing, um, like Nikki said, with the maintenance of Carex, pretty much a you know late winter, early spring cutback, and that was about it. Um, so as for the conditions there, the soil in their trial is a medium moist clay loam. Um, the pH is about 6.5, so not, you know, maybe slightly, slightly, you know, outside of what we have here. But besides the, you know, obviously warmer temperatures, pretty similar to conditions to what we see here in the Chicagoland area. Um, so each variety was grown in both shade and sun in this average garden soil. And data was collected in 2018, 2019. They did skip 2020 due to COVID, um, but then we're back at it again in 2021. So plants were evaluated for vigor and foliage quality on a weekly to bi-weekly basis. I think it probably kind of depended on time of year, um, but they collected all this data um, on the scale of one being the worst, to five being the best, and then took the average of this data collected by year, um, by week and by year, and averaged it out to come up with their final results. So um, in the final year also, they did do a mowing trial. So for the stands that they had left, um, they kind of would leave, uh, well, actually I have a picture in, in the next slide, so we'll, we can flip to that one. Um, but uh, they did do a mowing trial in the last year to evaluate, you know, that's a question that gets asked about Carex a lot. What can I use as a lawn substitute? Um, so you can see in the lower right-hand corner there, that's the Carex Pennsylvanica they had been evaluating. And they would basically, of the grouping they had, take the back section and mow that um, on a biweekly basis at a four inch blade height. Um, and so then from there, they used a similar rating system of one being the worst, five being the best of how the Carex was responding to that mowing. So um, in the report, they do highlight a few varieties, but again, there is additional information on the website. So we'll touch on a few that did uh, that had high marks in the mowing trial as well. Um, so then the other thing is, uh, just wanted to mention, and Nikki kind of touched on it too, that 4.0 was considered a top performer, 4.0 and above. But just because something didn't get that mark doesn't mean that it's not worthy of consideration. So again, there could be Carex that like, um, you know, poorer, drier soils or more moist soils than this trial, um, you know, had to offer. So they they do point out in their report that many of these are still worthy of consideration, but they just needed to be cited a little more specifically. Um, so that's kind of what we'll talk about too when we get to the second grouping. So, so we are going to move on and review the top performers. So first up, we have Carex albicans or white tinged sedge. 
Um, so this is native to the Eastern United States and often found in dry woodland areas. Um, so you can see in the picture on the upper left, kind of the identifying characteristic of this is that unique um, kind of brown to green flower and it's got a nice white margin on it if you're up close to it. So, um, so for notes from the Mount Cuba trial, this, uh, this carex did perform better in shade. Um, they did, even though it's more commonly found in dry areas, they did note that it seemed to adapt to the average soil just fine and formed really nice clumps in the shady area. Um, plants in full sun performed okay, but they tended to die out in the crown a bit more. So something they recommended for this was like, if you were using this in a sunnier spot, you may just need to divide this every couple of years to kind of keep that dead center, you know, keep help the plant keep reproducing. Um, so for Midwest ground covers, we have this planted in our dry shade garden. So you can see the photo in the upper right there, um, kind of they're right above the Brunera. No, it's a little bit small. Um, but that photo is from August of the second year um, after planting. So you can see it's still looking nice, still looking green. So it's it's sited where this plant would want to be sited in a drier, shady area. Um, so plants do get about 12 to 18 inches tall and they're clump forming. So they do spread rather slowly. They're not overly aggressive. So this is a great one to incorporate into, um, you know, perennial designs, into landscapes. It can play well with those other perennials like you see in that photo. So that is Carex albicans. All right, uh, Carex crinita is next or the fringe sedge. Uh, so this one is not one that we commonly see used. Um, I think more so because it does tend to get used as more of a restoration plant, but it definitely, I think, has some um, landscape qualities, too, that we'll talk about in a bit. So the native range on this one, you know, a lot of characters have very wide ranges. So this one, you're going to see um, greater Midwest out to the East Coast, up into Canada, um, as far south as like Texas and Georgia. Um, so pretty incredible range on this plant. Uh, native habitat out in the wild is uh, riparian, so you're, you're thinking wetland, um, wetland edge, stream edge, that kind of thing. So for kind of our kind of landscape applications, it may be good in a ditch, a uh, rain garden, bioswales, wetter locations potentially, um, where maybe you need some soil stabilization or, you know, some sort of nice looking plant. So the Mount Cuba trial, um, I think the number one thing that they really noted was this plant did really well in both sun and shade. Uh, so that's why it scored high and um, was highly recommended. The other thing was its seed set. Uh, so it gets these kind of attractive, kind of arching drooping um, seeds that you can see there up close and then on the plant that tend to persist um, well into fall. So. Uh, really nice looking plants, again, um, not really seen in the landscape, but we do have this one planted at Natural Garden. So Enrique, do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience um, with the plant? Sure. Uh, so this is actually will be a nice plant for the previous question, like what characters will grow well in shade and dry that is 12 inches taller. This is one of them. Um, and it's uh, clump farming is not going to spread by rhizomes, but it could uh, see itself by uh, spread by seeds. And usually you're going to see that the following spring. So whatever seed we don't harvest this year is not, is not going to be an issue this year. But it could be the following uh, the following spring. Okay. And I think you had noted too that you guys actually tried burning this one this spring. So most mostly, you know, you hear about carrots being cut down in like I said, late winter, early spring, but you guys actually did a trial on burning this one and it did seem to do well. Yes, we have we tried both mowing or cutting by hand and now burning. And before joining this meeting, I went uh, out there and took a look and most of the characters, if not every single one is doing well, which save us some labor and work. You know, mm -hmm. fire is easier to, do the work by hand. Yes. <laughs> cool. 
So um, just a couple other quick things to note on this one. Um, it does well in shade and it can also take um, heavy clay soils, which not all carics can. Um, I think the root system on this one is just a little bit um, more coarse, um, which allows it to take back clay soil. So, um, and this one is deciduous, so it will turn brown for the winter months. Okay, so next we have Carex amorei or riverbank sedge. Um, so this is one that's a little bit um, more commonly found in restoration as well than maybe in, um, you know, a designed landscape job. Um, but this is found throughout the central Midwest and into the mid-Atlantic. And um, although we see a picture of the seed head there, it, we don't see a seed head all that often. It's really more, more commonly grown for the nice blue green foliage kind of adding contrast to some other things in the landscape there. Um, so one thing to note about the Mount Cuba trial was they recorded the height at about 40 inches, which is a bit taller than we see um, here at Midwest. So that height of 18 to 24 inches is, is pretty consistent with what we see and what we have planted. Um, so other notes for the, from the trial is this did perform slightly better in the sun, but overall um, it did well in both sun and shade. It did have a 4.0 or over a 4.0 rating in both of them. Um, so this one, <laughs> they did note, it does spread pretty readily by rhizomes. And maybe as we go on to, to note about the width on some of these um, that are listed as spreading, I think when we did some of the widths on the carex, we were pretty conservative and maybe looking at, you know, a, a very short span of time of the spread because for a lot of these, Mount Cuba actually listed the width as indeterminate, just kind of if you plant them, they'll keep going and going. So again, our, our widths on a lot of these are probably a bit on the conservative side, I would say, throughout the course of the presentation. But uh, so one thing they noted on this one was if you are planting it in a garden center, a garden type setting, it will probably need some kind of containment or else it can kind of, you know, run loose. Uh, so Enrique, can you share, you know, some experiences on where you think this would be best situated? Yes, uh, we have it here close to the irrigation pond and that's where it does better because it's closer to water and oftentimes it gets like runoff water from uh, from rain or irrigation. So in that type of setting or jobs is gonna do great. Uh, like you mentioned in a garden, it will take more more maintenance. So this is something that you will have closer to the water and that, that way you will have low, low maintenance to, to do. All right, um, so that is Carex Moria, thank you. All right, the next one is Carex Jamesii. Um, so this is like, this is one that's relatively new to our product line. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is in a few minutes. Um, but this one was really, really highly rated in the uh, Mount Cuba trial based on its foliage. So it was, um, they noted that it was the greenest foliage, the most emerald green, very clean very clump forming, very attractive carex for more of a landscape setting. Um, so where we see this one, native range, very similar to the others. So um, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, all the way out to the East Coast and again up into Canada. Um, the habitat on this one, again, if you found it naturally, would be more of a woodland setting, woodland edge, or even a grassland setting. So again, foliage is kind of the key with this one. Um, flowers and uh, seed head, not a lot to really report on this one. So you're definitely using it as more of a foliage plant. Um, what was seen both in the Mount Cuba trial and what we've seen in the landscape is during that very um, hot kind of summer months, um, it was noted that the tips of the foliage will turn a little brown. Um, and I think that is reflected in the photo that you see there. So, um, but through the trial and also through what we've seen, um, it's not enough to totally make the plant completely unattractive. It still looks very good. Um, other carics, the browning can be much more extreme. Um, let's see here. 
it, and it is probably a little bit more sensitive to the summer heat, um, so shade can definitely be a help there. Um, it is a clumping carex, uh, so it'll stay in its nice tidy mound for you, um, just not really spread by aggressive runners. And this one is semi-evergreen. So um, I feel like semi-evergreen things can be more challenging when it comes to spring pruning. So what you're going to want to do here is just a light shear um, come late winter, early spring. That's really all this plant will need. Um, this plant was also ranked very highly on the lawn substitute trial. So um, like Shannon alluded to, this was one that just based on its size, um, you know, they thought it would make a good lawn substitute. So one thing to note, though, because it doesn't really spread by rhizomes and it's a clump former, you would have to plant it really closely together um, because they said it mowed really nice. But then you could see the individual clump. So, you know, they said um, based on what they were seeing, they felt like if you planted it really close together, you could get a lawn look. Um, so it did test very, very high on the mowing at over over four. Um, but like we noted, uh, this one has been hard for us to get into production, uh, which is always something that, you know, we're working on is the plants do well in the, the garden sometimes, but then we have a challenge with it in production. So Enrique, why don't you tell us a little bit about our production challenges um, and even some of the things you've actually seen um, in the CARES classroom. Yes, uh, it is a really nice plant. It is strangely, uh, the green color is like, probably one of the best when you talk about carexes. Uh, and yes, it's gonna look the best when, it's the, when the temperatures are cooler during the summer, it gets uh, brown. As far as production, it is very slow growing plant. Uh, it is, it, uh, the seed production is very, very, very low. So that's why we are having a, a hard time propagating it. And once we have some seedlings, the rooting uh, is still like very low. And even when it's, fully rooted, the root system is not that vigorous as like other or carcasses. So we, yeah, we're struggling with having this one. Yeah, and I think when we were talking about this prior to the presentation, Enrique had noted, like if you go out into the landscape, even an established plant and try and pull it out, the root system's very shallow on it, which um, could be leading to issues for us in production. There was a question on what the difference was, if it's similar to Carex Pennsylvanica. It is. Um, Carex Pennsylvanica, we'll talk about in a bit, but has better flower and seed, um, seed heads. Um, and I think the big difference is clumping versus rhizome. So this one's clumping, Carex Pennsylvanica is rhizome. So that's Carex genesii. Now we're gonna do a quick poll. Um, we're just interested out of these first four characters we talked about. Are you likely to try them? Not really interested. Um, just kind of curious on what you guys think about them. We do have a question about planting carex in a cleared woodland setting. Um, our My recommendation, just based on what we've seen in production and what we've seen in the carex classroom, would be to do logs instead of seed. Um, carex germin seed germination can be really inconsistent and it really depends on the variety or the species. Um, so I think it would probably be best to do plugs, um, and you could do a mix of species. Um, you know, it kind of depends on, on what the site is like, if it's pretty rich soil, if it's moist, if it's drier. Um, so just take notes today as we go through, because I think some people have it in their mind too, that carex always need to be moist and they don't. There's quite a few carex here that actually want dry soil. So, um, we can... Pay attention to that as we go through. Yeah, All right. and, the, oh, and then oh no, and I was just going to add that also, you know, there probably well is some benefit to to plugs and doing like a more of a matrix type planting than necessarily yeah. just a straight species as well. So correct, yeah, include some woodland forbs too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
All right, uh, Carrick's Alvacans and Carrick's James, yeah, I looked like the most interesting. So um, very good. Yeah, they're probably the best for landscape application. Yeah. All right, so next we are going to go to another good landscape plant, and this is Carrick's Mucking, Muskingumensis Oma. Uh, so this is named after Wolfgang Oma, who was part of the landscape architecture duo Irma in Sweden. Um, a renowned company out of DC. They did some work at the Chicago Botanic Garden, but he actually found this variety in his garden and introduced it to the horticultural world through Plant Delights Nursery. Um, and so it is kind of interesting that, you know, uh, Mount Cuba evaluates, um, you know, cultivars, not just the straight species because they definitely have a place in the landscape as well. So, um, in this case, there was both this variety and another cultivar of Carrick's muskingumensis that both ranked better in their trial than the straight species. And that's likely because again, they were kind of doing it in average soil where the straight species tends to prefer um, more moist riverbank type soil. So um, this was the only variety in the trial that had variegated foliage. Um, so you'll see when this variety emerges, it is that kind of brighter green color, it's solid, but then as, um, as it leaves out more, that thin yellow band on the edges appears. So really nice contrast there. Um, this variety did perform slightly better in sun um, in their trial, but again, did pretty well both ways. And that kind of mimics what we've seen at Midwest as well. So we have this planted in our revitalized median garden, um, kind of right in between our pickup yard and the asphalt for the, the office parking lot. And it's a pretty tough site, you know, pretty dry, surrounded by gravel, hot sun in a lot of cases. And uh, we've seen it do well in kind of just this mix of conditions. So we do have that clump that you see on the upper left that's in a sunnier spot. We do have some tucked away more under ornamental trees. Um, I think the one thing, if you put it in a little bit shadier area, I know I was talking to some of the staff at the Lurie Garden, and I believe they have it in a bit of a shadier spot, and it tends to flop a bit more. So that's the only downside to planting it in a bit more shade. Um, but otherwise, kind of same with soil conditions, where it performed well in the average soil of the Mount Cuba trial. Um, I would say where we have it sited, it's on the drier end for sure. Um, but then again, the straight species is going to prefer the more moist soil, which is where this is going to, you know, probably want to go in the grand scheme of things. Um, so can kind of tolerate that that mix of light conditions, the mix of soil conditions. Um, so just a really adaptable plant. Um, the other thing you see the nice seed heads on there, obviously it's got the variegation. So this is a great one as well for combining in, you know, in perennial designs. Um, and into the landscape. The one thing to note is with that variegated foliage, you kind of have to be up close to see it. So, um, you know, planting someplace where people are gonna be walking by or, or something like that, where they can really appreciate the effect of the foliage. So, so that is Carex Oma. All right, um, the next plant is Carex pennsylvanica, and we're getting a lot of questions about producing Carex from seed or division. So this will be the perfect plant to answer that question once we get to that, because um, that is one of our talking points on, on this one in particular. So range on this plant, very similar to the others, um, I, Dakotas, Iowa, Minnesota, all the way out to the East Coast and up into Canada. Uh, native habitat on this one is more forest savanna, um, and this one does pr prefer um, lighter kind of loamy textured soil. So this one may not do as well um, in a clay soil because it does have a pretty fibrous, um, light fibrous root system. So um, this is probably one that Carex that you think about a lot too from a lawn substitute. Uh, this one does spread by rhizome. So that's where it's different from the Carex Jamesii. Um, so it will kind of form this nice dense um, kind of lawn looking situation um, versus some of the other carrots. So you can see that picture on the top right that's actually on our property. Um, so we've planted carrots there and over time it is filled in really nicely. Um, 
what you see with Carex pennsylvanica as far as how it spreads is it spreads about three to eight inches a year, depending on how it's sighted um, and how happy it is. Um, for the Mount Cuba trial, the reason why it scored so high was because of its ability to pretty much perform almost the same in full sun to full shade. Um, it was probably the most versatile Carex um, along light requirements. So they didn't see a very big difference whether it was planted in full sun or full shade. So um, they also noted that it it is really, and we've seen this too, an excellent companion for taller perennials. Um, so we actually have um, an area where we have Dicentra come out in the spring. We also in our Carex classroom have it interplanted with Pulmonium. So really nice. Um, it's not very aggressive, so it won't choke out of perennials. It'll just kind of weave nicely um, around those plants. It does prefer to be on the drier side, um, so it can tolerate dry soil, dry shade, which is usually a pretty big landscape problem um, in drought once it's established. Now, Carex pennsylvanica will brown out a bit um, in the summer months, especially if it is in drier situations. But um, again, Carex are cool season sedges, so they'll be really green in the summer, fall, and a little bit brown in the summer. And you see this on this one. Um, this one also, I think, scored one of the highest scores on its mowing, um, the Mount Cuba mowing test. So again, in both sun and shade, almost performed the same, performed really highly. Um, one thing to note though, it will not tolerate foot traffic. So if you wanna use it as a lawn substitute, it has to be in a place that um, people aren't walking around. So let's talk propagation. And Enrique, we're gonna talk a little bit about Carex Pennsylvanica, but I think you could more broadly talk too about why do we produce some Carex from seed versus vegetatively, and what does that look like? Yes, that's, uh, that was one of the questions uh, before. So most of our propagation is done by seed, and that's our method of choice to do that. And what we do from vegetative propagation is only the species that we don't harvest enough seed. And Kerstens Panic is one, one of them that we do both. We do propagation by seed and uh, vegetative growth. And you can see in the bottom, um, the picture on the bottom, it does not produce a lot of seed and it's very, uh, it's quite challenging to actually go and harvest uh, because you have to, you can see it right now in the picture, you, you can see the seed, but when the seed is ready for harvest, you kind of have to go and look for it, moving the rest of the foliage away. So it is quite challenging to harvest. So, and, for the quantities that we need to grow, we just don't have enough enough seed. But uh, again, our method of choice of our production would be seed, and very few species are done by vegetative growth. And if you do vegetative growth, that has to be done when the plant is actively growing. So that's usually done in early spring or early fall. Um, much like if you guys ever ask us for a special grow, that's oftentimes why we have more time constraints on Carex because we can't um, produce it all year round. It just won't grow for us in the summer, so. Yeah, and just one more comment. If you try to do vegetative growth on Carex in the summer, it's gonna be very, very, very hard, hard to, to grow it actually. Mm -hmm. it could, uh, you could experience some uh, big losses. So yes, uh, it, it is, uh, mostly in late fall, early spring, when we do Carex Pennsylvania propagation. All right, that's Carex Pennsylvania. Okay, and we did have a question um, on Carex that can tolerate foot traffic. So um, even with Mount Cuba doing these mowing trials, they specifically did comment that more research is needed on the durability of, you know, Yes, I know that a lot of times we're looking as carrots as lawn alternatives and people are going to walk and play and all those kinds of things in their lawns. But I think there just haven't been kind of larger scale studies on, on which are really going to be able to hold up to that. Um, so hopefully we get more information on that soon. You know, if somebody takes on that project to find out. Um, okay, so moving on to Carex sprengalii. Um, or long beak sedge. Um, so this again is kind of a nice, um, a nice carex to combine into more perennial style planting. So it's a nat native of the Northern US. 
Um, so kind of where Mount Cuba is located in uh, northern Delaware there is the kind of the southern range of its, uh, you know, native native range. So kind of from there and north is where that is native to. Um, and it's often found in kind of more moist woodlands. Um, so Mount Cuba did find that this performed better in the shade, but it still was a good performer in sun. Um, it does flower in fruit in early April or in April into May. Um, you can see there, you know, the, the flowers are very nice. The one thing about it is after the first heavy rain, it kind of, you know, mats it down and causes it to flop. So um, I know we've seen some of the similar things here. Um, you know, like Nikki said, this one definitely performs better in shade and cooler temperatures like a lot of the carrots prefer. Um, it can tolerate some drought, but may go dormant in the hot and dry weather. Um, but otherwise, Enrique, I know this is one of your favorites. So do you have any specific comments on this one? Yeah, I really like this plant. As you can see on the picture, it's just like such a nice habit before it actually is ready for harvesting. Um, and also right now is the one character that is ahead of most of them. So that's told you quite a bit. Uh, it likes, uh, likes to be active when it's uh, cool, uh, the cool temperatures. You know, most characters, when it's super hot, they're not gonna do much. But yeah. uh, I really like the uh, plant habit in this one. You know, like the seeds just like hanging over like a little arches. So, and we do have some containers and it does well full time, but yes, it's gonna be more uh, or stressed. Okay, all right. So that is Kyrx Sprengelii and... All right, next we have Kyrx stricta or tussock sedge. Um, so this is one, again, kind of similar range. Uh, Dakota's, this one actually is found all the way out to Colorado, um, but then out east and up into Canada. Uh, native habitat on this one is more swamp, swales, and woodland edges. Um, and key attributes on this one, why it kind of got people's attention at the Mount Cuba trial, uh, was really nice flowers. Uh, so you can see that photo down there. Um, really nice kind of flower display. So this carex is clumping, and that is generally what we see, what our experience has been. Um, but through kind of researching the plant too, other folks do have experience with this one becoming more um, rhizomatous if it's sited in a wetter location. So if you do put it somewhere where you're, you know, have it on a pond edge or even a rain garden, you may see it start to spread a little bit more aggressively by rhizomes. Um, it does tend to perform best in full sun, um, but can take some shade as well. Um, in the trial notes for Mount Cuba, it stayed green even during periods of drought. Um, so as Shannon said, in the M Mount Cuba trial, they did not irrigate um, and, you know, they kind of let the plants be. So that's something to note that for them, um, it kind of stayed very, very green, um, even in the hotter parts of the summer. Um, and they did feel like it performed best in, uh, in garden soils. Now, this is one where I think we have had a different experience with it. Um, so I found that interesting. So it is like a lot of what we've seen in the Mount Cuba trial has been what we see, um, but this one, there were some differences. So Enrique, we have this one planted and uh, we maybe have a little bit of a different experience with it. So can you talk a little bit about what you saw on this plant? This one plant we have in both places on the Caris classroom and close to the irrigation pond. So in the Caris classroom, it, the area is shade and dry, and the plant doesn't die. It's still is there, but it's not as full. If uh, the one by the irrigation plant, for sure, uh, for sure, is more vigorous and more dense and fills in uh, the space over time. So yes, uh, it will prefer full sun and uh, close to the to the water. Awesome. Um, it is also noted that this uh, Carex is one of the best for um, habitat for rails and snipes, um, if you're into uh, kind of shoreline birds. Um, and I, I know the question came up before, a lot of Carex, most Carex are actually hosts for some sort of butterfly. So they're one of the biggest butterfly hosts out there. 
Um, so for, for larval feeding, so something to keep in mind. And this was one um, that does tend to um, host quite a few. So we're gonna move on to um, our next poll here uh, to talk about the, the four that we just spoke about, um, which one are you guys most likely to use moving forward based on what we chatted about. Um, and the next section of the presentation that we're gonna roll into are additional varieties. And again, um, these were ones that, you know, were noted in the in the Mount Cuba trial, um, maybe didn't get the, the top, top marks, but um, we've also had really, really good experience with these in the CARIX classroom. So we feel like they're worth bringing up. And we know we're running uh, we're running about seven minutes behind just because there have been so many questions, which we've loved. So um, we'll continue to try and move it along here so we don't go too far over time. Carex Pennsylvanica, always a favorite. <laughs> Enrique, you got some uh, convincing to do on the Carex Springelii. Almost got people. <laughs> They're somewhat likely. <laughs> All right, so we have Carex gracilima or purple sheath graceful sedge. Um, so the names come from kind of at the base of the grass when it's emerging, they can get a bit of a purple sheath to it. Sheath to it. Um, but then also graceful sedge kind of comments on the flowers and the seeds. So they kind of, you can see just like, they're not really doing it yet. You can see the seed like in the front kind of left corner, a little tiny, thought of it but when those fully um you know open up and flower it's kind of like a little thing of hanging beads so it's very cool graceful effect um but this variety is or this species is native to the northern midwest um and even some of the east coast and down to the south so a pretty wide native range here um and one other thing besides kind of the cool uh flower and, and fruiting effect. It does have nice glossy green, green foliage to it, excuse me. Um, so this performed equally well in the sun and the shade at the Mount Cuba trial. Um, they did note uh, that it kind of quickly flopped after seeding. Um, so I'm gonna have Enrique kind of talk on that in a moment. But the one other thing that they did note was this is really pretty similar in a lot of ways to Carex sprengelii, but they found it to be a little less vigorous. So that's kind of why Carex sprengelii uh, ended up in the top performers section and this did not. So again, just another plug, try try Carex sprengelii, it's a top performer. But um, Enrique, so a lot of Carex we see uh, tend to do this where either um, after harvesting or after seed, they get floppy. So kind of how, what do you do with those types of varieties? Right, uh, so we have done both where we cut them back right after harvesting. So, and that's a really good option if you have the time and the resources to do that. You will have a much better plant in a few weeks, like again, like a nice full plant again. Otherwise, if you don't have the resources, you will have to wait and the plant itself it will reflush through the middle of the plant. It takes longer, um, it will look good again. So it all depends on your on your resources or your preference or how you, you like to see things. Okay. All right, thank you, excellent. So yes, there's an option either way, it will get better either way. It's just kind of how fast you want to see that. So, um, so yes, that is Carex gracilima. All right, next is Carex grayi. And hopefully you guys can kind of see maybe why. Uh, this plant is notable definitely for its seed heads. It's probably one of the most um, interesting carex as far as seed heads go. And uh, it was the most talked about carex of the Mount Cuba trials because of its seed heads. So um, its performance was a little bit less on the whole sun and shade, pretty equal. It scored 3.7, 3.5 um, for, the, for their sun and shade scores. So um, did pretty well, but maybe not quite as, you know, high of a performer as some of the others. Um, so this one, kind of, again, similar uh, range, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Oklahoma out to the East Coast. Um, and habitat on this one, it's usually found in wetlands, but um, we have it planted on our Midwest Natural Garden property, not in a wetland location, 
both in sun and shade and it does pretty well. Um, Enrique, can you talk a little bit about where we have it and how it's doing and how you produce this one? Yes, of course, you know, uh, the one that I like the most are the more challenges. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, this one does really well in both sun and, and shade. So a couple of years ago, we established as tag bed. And that one is uh, also like takes like 50% shade, 50% sun through the day, because we have uh, in the middle of um, trees. So Right, the, uh, right at noon, it gets a lot of a lot of sun, but then afternoon it doesn't get as much. Um, it produces a lot of seed, but the seed germination is inconsistent. So you often have you oftentimes have to go and harvest the plants that are ready to upshift, and then go back uh, a couple of weeks later because it keeps uh, germinating. It's not like other characters like they germinate all at once and you upshift them and you're done. So this is something that you will keep in your um, seed flat or open flat or container and keep going harvest uh, when the plants are, are ready. And the seeds are super, super, super hard. You can't, you can squeeze them with your fingers. And the seeds are also delicious. So <laughs> uh, small mammals, muskrats, uh, deer actually love the seeds um, on, on this carrot. So maybe if you have perennials, you don't want deer to browse, maybe don't plant this one. But um, if you don't mind the deer coming, um, this one, they'll enjoy that as well. So, um, and, and to note too, most carrots, um, deer are not going to browse on, on them. It may, if you see a deer buy carrots, they may be browsing on the seeds. So just to differentiate there. Um, but common uses for that plant in the, in the landscape, rain gardens, woodland, woodland edges, um, and potentially along stream banks as well. Carex gray eye. All right, so next we have Carex grisia or wood gray sedge. Um, so if you are looking for this one on our website right now, you are not going to find it um, because this is actually going to be a new 25 introduction for us. We will have it in 38 cell plugs. Um, so Enrique is kind of just working on our propagation of this one right now. Um, but since it did, you know, have a, a pretty good rating in the Mount Cuba trial, we wanted to include it and kind of put, you know, some PR for it out there. Um, so this is native to the central and eastern U.S. in moist and shaded areas. Um, so kind of it's useful. You can see from the information it's a clumper. Um, so it does kind of form robust clumps of nice green foliage. So again, um, you know, nice shade plant. Um, Mount Cuba did find that it performed slightly better in the shade. Um, again, with a lot of them that we've mentioned, uh, this can be floppy, but it will get a second flush or like Enrique Gaines said, you can kind of encourage that second flush by cutting it back a bit. Um, so this one did have a, a decent rating in their, mow their mowing trial as well. Um, so it was rated as good for a shade variety moan. Um, and their suggestion too was that this could be a good alternative to Liriope. So if you've been using Liriope a lot and are looking for a native alternative to that, this is going to have a similar effect. You can see kind of a similar width on the leaf blade there, a little bit of a similar arching habit. So it might be something to consider if you're looking for an alternative to that. Um, so that is Carex grisia. Yeah. All right, the next one is uh, Carex bunny blue, which is part of the American Beauties uh, native plant line. And this was one that was kind of interesting that there were some pretty big differences from what we've experienced in the landscape versus what was seen at the Mount Cuba trial. So um, the straight species, um, kind of very similar plants, bunny blue was a chosen cultivar due to the foliage color. So it's supposed to be much more glaucousy blue than the straight species. Now on the Mount Cuba trial, they saw very little kind of blue color on Eric's bunny blue. Um, it was staying more green for them, which is interesting because we do have it planted here, um, actually here in St. Charles in the landscape um, in a shady location um, under some ornamental trees. And it's pretty blue for us. Um, I walk past it almost every day and uh, I really haven't seen it turn very green color. So it does stay nice and blue. 
Um, it definitely needs uh, moisture soils and more shade. So if you put it in a full, full sun location, you definitely might kind of burn off some of that blue color. So definitely keep it in a shadier area. Um, and let's see here. It is more, it's a more tidy option. If you use Carex flocca or flocca sperma, um, this could be a good option for you if you're looking for more of a clump forming Carex. Um, it's not going to run. It is a, a more coarse textured Carex, but um, could give you um, more of a clump look. Um, and I have also seen it noted as a possible substitute for hostas too, because again, that leaf blade's pretty thick. So, um, on this one, because it is semi evergreen, again, you're going to want to do a shear on it late winter. Um, it will, it will flush pretty early. Um, I think ours are in the garden with the warmer temperatures. So, um, you can do that. So that's Carex Bunny Blue. All right, so um, we are four plants in to these suggestions, and we would like to know which ones were most interesting. Now we have three more carrots for you guys to go, and we'll wrap up um, this presentation. There's so much to talk about with carrots. I feel like, I don't know about you, Enrique, or Shannon, but I feel like we could talk about carrots all day. <laughs> There was a question about Carex and salt tolerance. To be completely honest, I don't think I've ever read anything on salt tolerance in Carex. And I have, we do not salt here on the property. So unfortunately, we don't have firsthand experience. I don't know, Shannon, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, no, just that I agree that, um, you know, I don't remember reading as such. And yes. Yeah. We don't have good firsthand trials here. Yes. All right. Very interesting. Yeah, Bunny Blue is definitely a solid um, choice for a landscape application. Okay, so our next Carex is Carex radiata. Um, actually, our next two are going to be a bit similar, but Carex radiata is straight styled wood sedge. Um, and this is native to the Central and Eastern North America, um, kind of in woodland settings and particularly in wetter locations. Um, so you can see the soil conditions there, it does prefer, prefer moist soil. So um, for the Mount Cuba trial, this performed best in the shade. Um, this is another one that kind of lays down after flowering. This one in particular can like go really flat. Um, but again, it improves as the new growth kind of flushes out again. Um, but this one, maybe because of that habit, actually performed really well in the mowing trial, both for sun and shade. So um, a 4.0 in shade and a 3.8 in sun. Um, so this would be one to try there as well. Um, again, it likes the, the more moist to wet soil. Um, it's darker green, kind of the shadier situation you put it in. So it can take a little bit more sun, but it's going to kind of lighten up that color. Um, and this is one that through some experimenting Enrique has done, uh, it can take burning as well. So if you're looking for a little quicker way to do a spring cleanup, that is an option with this one. All right, the next one's Carex rosea. And a lot of times folks have a hard time uh, differentiating the two. Uh, they are very, very similar. Um, rosea will tend to stay a little bit more upright after, um, you know, producing seeds. So that is a difference. Um, and rosea actually likes drier soil. So if you're, you know, citing them, rosea, drier, um, radiata, wetter soils. So this one, um, again, Mount Cuba noted its floppiness and had a really hard time recovering after the floppiness. Now we haven't seen it quite that bad um, the way that they were describing it, but that was why it scored lower for them. Um, they also saw, this was interesting, big difference from us. They also saw a lot of attrition or plant loss in sunny, dry locations. We have it planted in a sunnier, drier location and it actually performs better for us. So it could just be a difference in how many hot days we have compared to them. You know, I'm not sure soil makeup um, and where we have ours cited, but we kind of saw completely opposite 
um, results from the Mount Kiva trial. So worth noting, um, Enrique, you have it planted two places. You have it in a shady location and a sunny location. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen, your experience? It's actually the two pictures you used, guys, uh, show those are in, in Caris classroom. So I, I would say Rosea, this one Rosea and Radiara are like, like 10 feet apart. So the previous picture from Ros, uh, Radiara and this one Rosea, they're like it's pretty much in the same conditions. And you can see the difference. This is not as green or glossy green and it's not as full. However, I will say like another 100 feet away from this picture was taken. We planted quite a few, but that spot gets more sun. And, it, and if we were to take a picture, which we didn't, to compare with this, it's way, way fuller than the one we're seeing here. So it, it, it prefers and it will do better uh, if it gets more sunlight through the day. Very good. Um, this one, they also did the lawn substitute trial on, and it did score pretty well on the Mount Kiva trial in shade um, mowing. It almost scored a four. So um, that could be something you could explore as well. Um, I'm a little bit of a plant nerd. I thought this was really interesting. So we talk about Carex. Carex have a pretty close relationship with oaks, um, and Rosie and Radiata actually have very close relationships with oaks. So out in the natural setting, um, rosia will often be found naturally with Quercus alba, rubra, and macrocarpa, which tells us it does like drier soils because those types of oaks like drier so soils. Um, Carex radiata are commonly found with Quercus bicolor, which is more of a kind of wetter um, oak. So I found that really interesting too, which kind of supports um, what we see in the landscape. So little bit about Carex rosia. All right, so our last Carex for the day is Carex trichocarpa or hairy fruited lake sedge. And I also saw, I think the Mount Cuba report actually had it listed as hairy fruited sedge. Um, and I was gonna take the lake out, but then I decided to leave it because it is a pretty good indicator of where this Carex wants to be. Um, and so as you can see, this one is a spreader and it's found in the northern Midwest and on the East Coast um, in wet meadows and marshes. Um, and so some interesting things to note from the Mount Cuba trial is the overall rating was better in the sun. And they said there that it had denser foliage, you know, so a more dense looking uh, grouping. Uh, but then in the shade, the foliage itself actually looked better. So probably, you know, a bit less scorched or tattered or something to that degree. So that's kind of an interesting one is what's your application going to be? You know, is it you just want it to cover and, um, you know, you don't really care about the how the foliage itself it looks. Nobody's going to be looking at it up close. Or is it something where, you know, people are going to be seeing it more frequently, then it might be better to cite it in a little bit more shade. Um, another thing they noted on this one was that uh, no flowering or, or, or very limited flowering and seed production were noticed in the trial. So this was really, you know, for the foliage coverage and effect. Um, so we do have this one in our Carex classroom. Um, so Enrique, actually, we have it in a couple different sites. So can you talk about um, where the best placement for this species is going to be. I think it's pretty similar to the Mancuba. Uh, so actually the picture on the, uh, on the top, that's how green it looks like in um, Kairos classroom. It's not super full, but that's the color that you're going to see. However, if we move closer to the water, uh, it's not gonna, it's not going to be as green, but it's going to be fuller. And you know that one rooted, uh, the root system is pretty deep and pretty strong. So this is something for you to have closer to water where you want uh, to prevent from some erosion. And uh, garden, it, it won't spread that uh, that fast because it will require more water. But the color will be will be really nice, uh, green color. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good information. So with that, I think we have our final poll. And as you guys do the poll, um, I'll do my closing comments. So 
Thank you guys so much for joining us today for the webinar. We really appreciate your time. We hope you got something out of this. Um, again, CARIX is such a big topic. I feel like we could talk about it for a really long time. So if you are a customer of ours, uh, Green Industry Friends, um, you are always welcome to come walk our CARIX classroom during business hours. Um, you know, if you wanted to do a self-guided tour, we have a lot of information on our CARIX classroom on our website, including a map. Uh, so you can stop by, you know, see how it looks seasonally, stop by in the spring, summer, fall. Um, that's really how how I've learned a lot about how these plants have performed, as well as Enrique and Shannon. Um, if you would like a guided tour, you know, reach out to the sales team. We would love to, to host you and your company um, to talk more about Carex or native plants in general. Um, make sure to give us a follow on Instagram, both for Midwest Ground Covers, Midwest Trading and uh, Natural Garden. Um, we like to tell you guys what's going on. Shannon and I are probably going to kick off some garden walks soon to let you guys know what's going on and what we're seeing out there. So, but again, we really appreciate your time and, uh, thank you guys so much. Happy spring. Have a wonderful spring. <laughs>